So what's good TMG fam, it's your boy L and I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. So listen, man, the story that we're getting into today, today's case study is Russell Tills and his house of horrors. Now, I ain't even going to lie to you, man. The first person that came to mind when I think of house of horrors, uh, maybe because his name was on my timeline today, was like the whole R. Kelly situation, man. You know what I mean? Just the... Uh, did y'all actually remember the interview that was given where they went through like the house and showed the rooms and one of the girls was in there man it was just it was just so horrifying man just to hear them talk about being in a room and not being allowed out and having to be having to use that bathroom in the room it was just it just took me back to that moment of seeing that interview man and I was just like I was horrified for those women, man. Just horrified for them. So seeing, hearing a house of horrors, that's what brought up in my mind. So I don't, I don't know why it took me there or anything like that, but it's just still baffling to me. All right, so we're gonna get into this case, man. If you are new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. And to all the haters, yes, I see you in the comment section, bro. You know, and although I don't maybe respond to your comment, Run the lights up, baby. Run the lights up, all right? <laughs> Appreciate the fam for running the lights up, though. Let's go. Hey, you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we're talking, we're talking neighbors. You know, you know that sense of community, heartwarming. But you know, we've all, uh, we've all had neighbors, right? Who, um, just plain suck. But what if they were much? Hold on, y'all, before we get into the mission. Oh, I didn't do it. I knew it. And we was about to get deep into it. And my bad. Let me switch that. I got it. Here we go. <laughs> Restart. Here we go. Hey, you, and welcome. My name is Mike. And in this old video, we're talking, we're talking neighbors. You know, you know that sense of community heartwarming but you know we've all uh, we've all had neighbors right who um just plain suck but what if they were much 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 more than that because in florida <laughs> come on where else in a little old property in jacksonville folk had complaints they didn't know how right they were so let's give it a go As soon as you walk outside tomorrow and you see your name and you wave, you're gonna think about this video, bro. <laughs> I know it. So it is to Jacksonville that we're off to. The address being 3551 Bowden Circle in South Jacksonville. The House of Horrors. In that leafy suburb, the neighbors knew that address and that occupant all too well. The Tillis family had actually lived there for decades, but it was in 2012 when Russell Tillis reclaimed the family throne that the um, doo-doo hit the wall, metaphorically speaking, actually maybe not just metaphorically speaking, I'll have to check that, because in this house, yeah. Russell turned the house into a fortress, making sure no one could see exactly what he was up to in there. But though they couldn't see, they could hear. They could hear screaming. A lot of screaming. The neighbors lived in fear of that house. He would threaten those around him all the time. He'd jump at their fences, wash them in their gardens. They were terrified. Women were constantly going to and from the house, some sticking around for a little bit, others never seen again by anybody. There were times when women would run from the Tillis house naked and screaming for help, banging on neighbors' doors. Not much would be done about that for a long time. What? 
And when the police finally did make it inside, they found the house booby trapped. What I often wonder about that, man. Like, how do these people make it so long when the obvious signs are there? You got women running from the house naked. You got them banging on neighbors. No, how does that person still continue on this lifestyle or whatever it is? Because I have no idea what he's doing yet. How does he continue? But yet, somebody who's doing something that not even close to what they're doing. They're locked up, tried guilty and sent to jail for 30 years but this person has this lifestyle for years and nothing happens and it makes you think well is he a celebrity is he does he know somebody that's the part i want to know how, do, how does he do it one officer got a four inch nail into his foot hidden nail boards were were a favorite of russell's also rusty razors electric wires all that oh he didn't want anybody coming in or going out. So. But the real horrors were what was going on underneath. So who was slash is Russell Tillis? Well, as you can imagine, Russell, he, he, he was rusty to his friends. We're fortunate enough to not be counted among that. So it's Russell to us. He had quite the police record going back to his, to his young days when he was a young fella. Born in 1962, he lived at that same house of horrors as a kid. Grow All right, people, let's not profile. Let's not profile. And when I say people, God darn it. God, Lee. Got me spitting everywhere, man. All right, let me try that again before I just wash my whole laptop. <laughs> but um, let's not profile this guy based upon his mugshot. And when I say people, I'm actually talking to myself. You know, I'm trying to coach myself not to profile this guy, all right? Growing up there with his brother Claude and his parents. His daddy -o, Claude Sr., was a drunk, he was abusive, sexually abusive even, to his wife and his two sons, Claude Jr. and Russell. When Russell's mother, Margie, figured out what her husband was doing to their two sons, she made them go live in the trailer out back and told them never to open the door to their dad. As he grew up, Russell turned to petty crimes, drugs, an entire life of crime stretched out before him. On one hand, you know, you gotta say, well, Jesus, like, fucking hell, he didn't have a chance. On the other, he'll do worse. After growing out of a special school for troubled kids and then juvenile, he decided to up sticks and get as far away from Jacksonville as he could, landing in California in 1981. Russell, with his mother's uh, help, he kicked his drug habit and he wanted to start anew. Start fresh, California fresh. In California, he met a girl, 16 year old Shannon Brinkley, three years his junior. They hit it off when they met at a social welfare office and soon were an item with Shannon eventually becoming pregnant. And as things started out well, you know, they didn't stay that way. They don't usually. Shannon started to, uh, you know, hmm, start to suspect something was a little bit off with old Russell. It turned out he was cooking meth, getting high on his own supply. When Shannon discovered this, she took their baby boy and left. And so after that, Russell decided to up sticks once more and head back, head back home to northern Florida. His family, his parents still live there, his brother lived there, so Russell went back and he set himself up as a handyman, a white van man. Things wouldn't go smoothly from there, <laughs> let me tell you. This is when the real shit spirals out. In 1989, Russell was charged and convicted of kidnapping. See, one night, Russell was driving along the interstate, and he decided to be a good Samaritan by picking up a lady whose car had broken down. Good Samaritan in, like, the uh, opposite world. He offered to take her to the nearest gas station, but, um, he didn't do that? Nope. Instead, he drove her to a building site he worked at, and then he attacked her. Oh. He started choking her and was about to sexually assault her. And see, people, this is why no one standing on the side of the road asking for help should get upset when people pass you by, and vice versa. You know what I mean? Nobody should be upset either way because you just don't know. You know what I mean? Like one of the oldest scams in the book is people pulling over 
and acting like their cars broke down and you pulling over to help them, they hitting you over the head for something. Now you wake up in their trunk. Never get upset with somebody passing by you because they don't know you. They don't know what your intentions are. When another car showed up. Now he was convicted of those charges, but he didn't serve a lick of jail time. What? I have no idea why. 1989, right? What a time to be alive. Not necessarily a good one. Maybe they thought they would just, you know, scare him straight, turn him into a good boy. You know, a That's not what happened. They were very wrong. Things continue to get worse. Very worse. In 1993, he did do jail time for burglary. Once released, he was out for an entire year before ending back up in the slammer in 1999. This time for breaking and entering and Grand Theft Auto. He got served with five years of his life this time. But, you know, some people, they kind of waste time, faff about while in the pen, right? Do whatever. And not Er Russell. He'd use that time to be gooder at being badder. Not by, you know, making connections, getting involved with a gang or anything like that. No. No. He would use, he would learn the law and use it against the law. He'd fight fire with fire. Going through and devouring as many legal books as he could in the prison library. He wanted to have all this knowledge so that next time, and he knew there would be a next time, he'd know the law inside and out and use it for his advantage. Uh -huh. So he was out in 2004, after which he would do something really horrible. In March 2006, a 14-year-old girl needed a ride home. She had missed the school bus. Russell Tillis happened to be driving by and pulled over. She got in, and he drove to a car park, hit her, and told her to strip. She was absolutely terrified, right, as, as you can imagine. And so she thought to herself, you know, the only way she would be able to survive this was if she told Russell that she was a sex worker, and that violence wasn't necessary, she would do whatever he wanted her to do. I told you this was... But eventually he dropped her off, not at her real address, and she reported it to the police. A sketch was made up, and they also got Russell's DNA. It was almost two years later that they finally brought him in. Bro, if, if we're not sitting here screaming that the system has failed in this situation, bro, I am losing my mind right now. First of all, back when he did the, the, the one of the other crimes and got off and didn't get a sentence. Now you put him in a in in prison. Now he done learned all this stuff and he's still like, oh my gosh, bro, this oh, well, like what type of rehabilitation? Because that's what you're supposed to go to jail for rehabilitation, not just stuck in a cell. It should be rehabilitation. Try to figure out what is going. If that I'm gonna pay my tax paying money to this stuff. How about we either try to fix them or keep them until they're fixed? You know what I mean? Like, what? I'm losing my mind right now. We've got, that's a little girl. It was almost two years later that they finally brought him in. I've never threatened any of them to ever kill him or beat him up if they didn't do it, sir. No. He yapped away saying, yeah, he, he enjoyed that company of sex workers, but he didn't know she was underage. She told him, you know, she was a sex worker. And that was all he needed to know. So the names don't really mean much. I mean, you pick a girl up, you have sex with her, you drop her off. The, the name is, is, is irrelevant, really. And the age of the victim? The alleged victim? The minor. Well, we're here at the legal age for you. He got an entire four years for that one. <laughs> wow, wow, wee, wow. He got the entire book just like fucked at him, right? Unfortunately, the book was about, like, this size, so... When he got out in 2012, he moved back to 3551 Bowden Circle. He turned it into a castle, a, a shite castle. For the next three years, police would be called there over 80 times. Neighbors would constantly hear machinery, drilling, and... Yeah, screaming. 
The neighbors lived in fear. Some even filed injunctions for protection against Russell. He would threaten to kill them on the reg. The police were not uh, the most helpful about this. They haven't actually been throughout this entire story. They would be called to his house so often they would stop giving a shit. As I said at the beginning, Russell would often call the ladies of the night over, uh, sex workers. You know, some would be addicts, he would get others to be smurfs, you know, which- I knew that was gonna happen. I knew that was gonna happen. When, when he fig when that girl told him she was a sex worker, he was gonna get it in his mind and say, this is the route I'm gonna go now. And I'm only gonna go after sex workers and now drug addicts, people that, you know, society deems as they view them a certain way so they don't too much care about them. So they don't really care about what I'm doing to these girls to that extent. You know what I'm saying? I knew that's where his mind was going to go, bro. I was sitting there saying that to myself. Piece of shit. For, uh, sex workers, you know, some would be addicts. He would get others to be smurfs, you know, which basically... They would go to pharmacies and buy stuff he needed to make drugs. Yeah, he's back. Time to cook. But on more than one occasion, uh, Russell's helpers slash sex workers slash addicts, they would wake up in Russell's house chained to a bed and Russell would do what Russell does. He would keep them as sex slaves in his house, only escaping when, you know, Russell would forget to do the locks all the way. Twice, they would manage to escape naked and screaming, banging on the neighbors' doors, telling them that Russell was going to kill them. What happened? Sweet fuck all. A major part of this right here is, you know, um, what are called the less dead. Sex workers, when they're found murdered, the police don't really look into it too hard. So if they start reporting, you know, stuff happening like this and that they're being, you know, almost murdered, they don't really care. And when it came to Russell, they doubly didn't care. Another time, a neighbor, hearing screams coming from Russell's house, called the police, called 911. No officer ever showed up, and the screams eventually stopped. It was in 2015 that Russell was finally arrested for the final time, with, with great difficulty, as you will see. And when he was finally arrested, right, it wasn't for abuse, Assault, attempted murder, sexual assault, anything like that. No, no, no. It was for violating uh, neighbor's restraining orders. See, remember his house was booby-trapped, right? Nails, boards, razors. The first few times police rocked up, he would scurry away into his house like a rat. Police who followed would step on four-inch rusty nails. So on the night of May 28, 2015, the police said, Fuck that, we're not, we're not going in there, you know? We'll, uh... We'll lure him out, lure him into a trap. They started throwing rocks at his gaff, hoping, you know, he might pop out, pop head out, have a goo, see what this ruckus was about. And he did. Then what happened, it's, uh, kind of disputed, right? I'll hear some clips of what each side says happened then. The officers went to a residence at 3551 Bowden Circle East uh, to arrest Russell David Tillis, a uh, white male, age 55, who had two outstanding uh, misdemeanor warrants. How many people is, are you a TMG fan member right now? You a fan member for life. If the first person you thought about when you seen this podium was Grady Judd. If you did that, put me a Grady Judd in the, hashtag Grady Judd in the comment section right now, bro. I know that has nothing to do with what we watching, but automatically my mind went to think of what would Grady Judd be saying right now, bro. Uh. Uh, white male, age 55 who had two outstanding uh, misdemeanor warrants. Uh, during this uh, incident, when the officers were there, uh, Russell Tillis armed himself with two knives and then began to violently resist arrest uh, with the officers. Uh, he was taken into custody. He was charged with aggravated assault, uh, battery on a law enforcement officer, and several additional charges at that time. The police said he ran at them with knives and they got into a struggle. Russell was then charged with aggravated assault on law enforcement officers, resisting arrest and battery of an officer. All the charges combined would be a life sentence at Russell's age. So that's what they say happened, and even though they had pepper spray, tasers and pistols, they didn't use them on a guy they say charged at them with knives. Russell said he ran away from them, he got scared because they didn't identify themselves as police. They caught him and uh, beat the ever-living shit out of him. 
Well, the cops uh, appeared across the street from my house about one o'clock in the morning, dressed in all black, not marked as police officers. They threw one pound rocks over the fence on top of a metal roof of my home. When I come out to investigate the disturbance, they were hiding in the bushes. They made a rush attempt to grab me and I ran. I didn't know who it was. They ran me down and beat me up. And I believe that's the photograph the state showed the uh, jury. Leaves all in my hair, dirt on my shoulder. I got beat up pretty good. Okay. They found a knife in my pocket and another knife that was on me. They charged me with uh, holding them at knife point in front of my house. It was a horrendous deal. Why do I feel like he's about to walk? Why, why do I feel like he's about to walk on this one? Now Russell was charged with hefty charges, to be fair, uh, but in the grand scheme of things, it wouldn't really matter. So Russell was now in jail, right, 2015, going into 2016, on myriad charges. And it appears, while in jail, he became a little depressed. Ooh -hoo. I'm sure his victims will take great solace in that. At one point, he genuinely was hospitalized after overdosing on uh, antidepressants. Yeah, it's the, the depression was present from the arrest, but escalated very quickly in the first three, four months. So I would trade a tray of food for, I think it was 100 milligrams of Elevil. So I traded about, I don't know, 10 trays of food, got me about 1,000 milligrams, and I ate them. All 1,000 milligrams. I figured that was enough to kill me. And after that, Why do I feel like that that time he spent reading all those law books and different things he's using right now and trying to manipulate the system. Cause I don't for a second buy this, this, this BS story of him going through depression. Stop. None of them other girls can, can sit up here and talk about, no, no, no. After everything you did, you want to feed us that? I, I have no, see, that's why I can't be a juror right now. I don't need to be a juror. That, right? Bright spark. He had an idea. Now, this is either the greatest idea or the shittiest, but I guarantee, my friends, you have not heard of one quite like this before. So, as I said, Russell, around the time, talking talking early 2016, he had been in jail, maybe maybe seven months, and he, he was feeling blue, you know? We all get down from time to time, but it had nothing to do with the acts he had committed, let me tell you. That's not why he was feeling a little bit, you know, Russell went to another inmate, a fella named Sammy Evans. Sammy was in jail facing a life sentence of his own, so Russell thought they, they could help each other. After all, Russell, you know, remember, he knew all about the law, beefing up his knowledge over the years. So Russell went to Sammy and said, hey, I'll help your case. I'll help your case, you know, using my law knowledge if you help me. Help me get the death penalty. What? What? And I want the death penalty. What? I don't think I've ever heard anybody request the death penalty for themselves. Oh, this dude is different. Because I'm fixing to get this 30 years, and I don't want to die a slow death in prison. I was 55 at the time. I've lived a pretty good life. I figured I'll, I'll get the death penalty, and I, and I won't die that slow death in prison. Well, Evans was, he was, he was, uh, cooperative with with that but at first he was a little hesitant he's like when first you have to understand it's not normally something someone would walk up to you and say i want you to go get the wire and i want to confess to you and the first question was why don't you just tell the police <laughs> what do you need me for i mean that's the logical inference of a conversation like that okay so what happened well, I told him, I told him pretty much the details of it. Murder itself does not always constitute a death penalty. You have to have aggravating factors. And I, I have knowledge of the law. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, you know, I'm not that smart, but I do have some workable knowledge of the law. I know about aggravators. I know about the law. I know how to read the law. I know what, I know what kind of murder it takes to get the death penalty. And I know what kind of murder would be rejected. If, if, if you wanted to say you committed a murder and you wanted the death penalty, 
And you said, well, I committed a murder. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the death penalty. You must have some serious, heinous, aggravating factors. And I'm knowledgeable of that sort of thing. Russell came up with a plan to confess to some cooked up heinous crimes that would get him the L injection. Instead of slowly dying behind bars for 30 years on the aggravated assault charges and all that. Now this part, it's kind of interesting because in my opinion, these crimes are not cooked up at all. This is real. He was going to confess, not as, you know, some kind of act of contrition, but because he just was not arsed. Slowly rotting away in prison for the rest of his miserable life. So Russell got Sammy to write a letter to the police about a, um, homicide, right? Sammy was then wired up, you know, by the detectives, and on the 5th of February 2016, he passed Russell a note in uh, jail saying, I'm wired. It's go time. And so Russell started talking. Here's the transcripts. He told of how he would lock women in the soundproofed torture chamber in his house. And he would have other guys come over to, well, rape them, including his brother Claude. Other times, these, these Johns would come over to torture these women, break their faces, pull out teeth. He would charge for this. Sometimes he would let them go after a week or so. He knew the police wouldn't come knocking, they didn't care. Other times he would kill them and chop them up, disposing of them around Jacksonville. He told of one time when his brother Claude came over for a woman and she recognized Claude. Remember, Claude lived there his whole life. And so Claude forced Russell to kill this woman. Russell did kill her and Claude dismembered her. Then he buried her in the yard instead of dumping her remains around town. His number of dead women was between three and six. So, if he wants the death penalty, why are we going to give him what he wants? See, I'm conflicted with that right there. Because on one hand, I'm like, yeah, go on and give him what he wants. He's out of here. He's gone. But then is that the easy way out? Is that to... No. Make him rot. Let him rot in jail for the rest of his life. Better yet, now that you know he don't want to be there, put him in solitaire for the rest of his life. Make it even more, you know what I mean? Don't give him what he want. This is the first, uh, yeah, don't give him what he want. It's pretty shocking stuff. You can read through the entire transcript and send the sources down below. Ruff Russell, he talked about kidnapping, sexual assault, sex trafficking, multiple murders, and dismemberments. But here's the problem. Was this true or was this false? Russell was a pathological liar his entire life. Russell drew Sammy a map, a map of the house at Bowden Circle and described where there was a body. This made its way back to the police and they got a warrant to search the property. And guess what? They found a body. With the help of DNA, it was determined to be that of Joni Lynn Gunter. Joni was from Gainesville, born in 84. She had two siblings and they lived with their mother until she passed away in a car accident. Their grandparents applied for custody, but it was refused as they were unemployed, so they went into foster care. They moved around quite a bit and they remained close. Unfortunately, Joni, she got into drugs at a young age and eventually turned to sex work. She lived on the streets and would disappear from time to time. Until in 2014, she disappeared for, for longer than usual. And eventually turned up in Russell's garden. The autopsy report showed that Joni's cause of death was multiple blood force trauma injuries to the head, uh, at least five. She also had fractured bones in her hands that showed, well, they were defensive. She is believed to have been murdered between February 2014 and May 2015. She was dismembered and in that shallow grave were hammers and saws. Now Russell was charged with first degree murder. 
He was a menace, according to neighbors, a source of threats, harassment, and obscene signs. It was very nice and quiet until he came to the neighborhood. We've lived four years in, in horror. The fear he instilled only grew last winter when police found a body buried in his backyard. I have no clue who it is. I'm sure that Jacksonville Sheriff's Office has done some sort of uh, intense investigation trying to determine the identity of that person, but me personally, I don't know. What was your reaction to human remains being found on your property? It's kind of a numbness feel. Why? Surprise. So, just kind of numbness. And you had a change of heart. Remember the This fool. This fool has done this, said this on tape, and now it's a surprise. They got you on tape. <laughs> Remember, the only reason they found that body was because Russell, he, he wanted to. He showed them where it was. He wanted to get death. Do you know how they ended up buried on your property? That's the second time you've asked me that question. <laughs> Are you able to answer it? Ma'am? Can you answer it? Well, not in full elaboration like you want me to, no. Because I must wait on uh, pending charges, if there will be any at all filed, before any of that comes out. Did you murder the woman who was found buried in your backyard? No, I did not, nor have I murdered anybody else. And did you have anything to do with those human remains ending up on your property? That's, uh, that remains to be seen in the future. I know y'all see me scratching my hat right now. And yeah, I'm I'm completely befuddled. If that's the word I choose to use today, befuddled at this dude. Fam, what is he doing? What it what type of manipulation scheme is he trying to run right here or trying to pull, bro? This is crazy. Meaning what? Meaning that. He was obviously feeling a little brighter now. Yeah, sun's shining. Because now he was saying his brother did it. His brother killed her, even though he previously said he killed her. Yep. Now Claude killed her, and he dismembered her, when previously it was the other way around. So hard to tell what's true and what's false. He said during the trial, I was depressed back then. I wanted you guys to kill me. It's all lies. And I have enough knowledge of the police in Duval County to know that once they find a body, the rush to justice, they don't care about any other facts, like finding Dave, finding Jimmy, the other multiple murders. They don't care anything about that. They got the body, they got the confession, and they rushed to justice. I relied upon that. Well, that was all fictitious. The, the, the kidnappings, the other murders, the torture, the soundproof room, those were those were the aggravating factors that I had created that would get me the death penalty. It, I couldn't just say, well, I know where body's at and I killed this girl. Right. Because then am I going to get the death penalty? Right. So the sex trafficking, was there ever any sex trafficking? No, in absolutely not. Um, no human trafficking? In no, case. no. There was none of that going on in that house. Yes. Was there a... <laughs> Claude was questioned about this and he denied having anything to do with Russell. He said he was scared of Russell, never wanted anything to do with him, never visited him. One way or the other, I don't care how bad I feel about you and the things you've done to me over the years and the things I've done to you, and this is not something I would do to you. I just wouldn't do it. Knew nothing about sex slaves, torture chambers, Joni Lynn Gunter, nothing. After all, in the tapes, Russell said Joni was the person who recognized Claude, hence, hence her murder. They said they found the body over there. I'm, ha I'm having problems getting out of here now. They seem to think for some reason I had something to do with it. I well, just hear me out, right? right? You know, I know some bad shit happened at your mom's house. God, I know, but okay. I got it. Well, listen, we know more than what you think we know already. Well, I'm Why else that. do you think we would have you here? I don't know. I'm just okay. other than that. I really, I'm, well, look, I give you DNA. I got no problem with that because I, like I said, I ain't got nothing. Uh, I know let I me get this consent. Tell me about this room, this soundproof room. I know. don't know anything about a freaking soundproof room. I told you, I ain't been in that house the whole time he was lived in it. I damn sure don't know nothing about no dismembering, no freaking body hole, man. Should we listen to your brother when he says, you're you're the monster and not him these things that were intended meant to happen or are they just 
you know, what? I would like an attorney present. At the trial, which went ahead in 2021, nearly everyone who was involved with Russell came forward and testified. Shannon, his partner from California, the two victims of his drive-by kidnappings, his son, his brother. When it was Russell's time to testify, he took the stand. He happily took the stand and told his version of how Joni Lynn Gunter ended up in his yard. He said to his brother Claude, showed up at the house out of the blue one day with a dead Joni Lynn Gunter in the boot. He said he didn't know how she died. He didn't even know her name until until she was ID'd. It be your own family, man. Your own family would do that to you? You can't trust nobody. He didn't know how she died. He didn't even know her name until, until she was ID'd. And together, they dismembered her and buried her. The reason was he was close with his brother and wanted to cover for him. So he gets out of the car and uh, he wants me to help him with a problem. He goes around to the back of the car and he opens a trunk. And uh, that's the first time I've seen Joni Gunner. She was in the trunk and there was a mass amount of blood on her chest when she was dead. He wanted me to get in the car with him and help him go down the street and dispose of her. But I wouldn't get in the car. And I told him, I'm not, I'm not getting in the car. <laughs> Absolutely not. The police fully investigated Claude Tillis and found there was no truth to Russell's story. Whew. Shannon actually said something really important during the trial. She said that Russell felt a trill and was proud of himself for deceiving people. He struck me as the kind of person who, uh, he liked to tell stories about times that he got away with stuff. He seemed to get a little bit of a thrill from uh, getting away with stuff. Um, like outsmarting people and um, I remember him telling stories you know uh, to that effect and I was like what I, I always wondered why you know that was so important to him and that's just what he tried to pull off but thankfully uh, he failed this time womp womp <laughs> Verdict is to count one. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. He was sent. Never clapped. But they got it right this time. Guilty of premeditated first degree murder as well as abuse of a dead body and kidnapping. The human trafficking charge was inconclusive as there was no evidence it actually happened. The people in his stories were, well, they were never questioned if they actually existed at all. Then came the question, did Russell deserve the death penalty or not? One which he had been dying to get, but now wasn't really a fan. Nah, not for me. In the end, the verdict wasn't unanimous, which it, it needs to be. So instead, he got two life sentences plus 30 years. I wonder if he ever really wanted it even to begin with. That's what I was just about to say. Did he manipulate my mind into thinking, or our minds into thinking that he wanted it, but he really didn't? Cause he figured once they find everything he did, he'd get it. So he'd manipulate us out of getting the death penalty. My brain hurts just going through that in my mind right now. But I'm thinking that's what he did. or if it was all a game to him. I mean, he's, he was pleading not guilty during the trial, which would get the death penalty. So hard to make sense of him at all. Maybe it was all to give himself time behind bars and try to use his knowledge to get away with his crimes, using, you know, little loopholes in the system. While the police searched the House of Horrors, they found plenty and plenty of women's belongings, adding some truth to his torture chamber stories, as well as a faded Polaroid photo of a young woman. To this day, police are looking for any information about this woman. No one knows who she is or what became of her. 
it's a crazy story um, of what I believe to be a serial killer. I do believe his stories that he was murdering women and chopping them up. Now, they didn't find any more bodies in his house of horrors, and they, they, they thoroughly looked. It's By the way, the house has been destroyed now. Um, but he said, you know, he had dumped them all around the place anyway. It doesn't take much of a push to get from what he was proven to have done to, well, much, much worse. And Russell, who said he didn't want the death penalty, he didn't want to, you know, rot away in prison for the rest of his days. Well, his little plan kind of backfired on him, because now he will rot away in prison for the rest of his days, the old bastard. Russell, tell us. Russell fucking gobshite. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate you uh, taking the time. Here, go on. I'll see you as always real soon in the next old video. Till then, please look after yourselves. Wow. It'd it, it be the people that you least expect or the people that you do expect. You know what I'm saying? So the next time you walk outside your house and your neighbor says, Hey, how you doing? Come on by sometime. Be careful, all right? I'm sorry to do that to y'all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to do that to y'all, man. But still, y'all be careful out here, man. Everybody's not who they say they are. And there's some crazy people out in this world, man. This was... A crazy story for the books, man. This was one for the books. Definitely. Y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what you think. And until the next reaction, I'm out. Peace, y'all. Stay solid. Hey.